Hello everybody and welcome to this session entitled Global Clinical Trial Support Platform Connecting North America, Australia and Europe. My name is Lynn Hughes and up to three months ago I was VP and Global Head of Therapeutic Strategy for Quintel's IQVIA. I was there for 24 years and have been involved in more than 120 global Alzheimer's studies in Phase 2 and Phase 3 over the last 10 years. Before I introduce our session, I would like to ask our distinguished panellists to introduce themselves, please. John, please could we start with you? Of course. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, my name is John Dwyer. I'm the president of the Global Alzheimer's Platform, uh, American not-for-profit dedicated to reducing the cost, time, and improving the effectiveness of Alzheimer's clinical trials. Uh, I have a pronounced family history of the disease and took this job uh, at the request of our board six years ago uh, and have been uh, had the privilege, frankly, uh, of working with the rest of my panelists on a number of studies in an effort to uh, uh, achieve our mission. Uh, and now you, Chris. Thanks, John. Uh, I'm a neurologist and a researcher. I've been in the research field in Alzheimer's disease and dementia for over 20 years. I'm the leader of the Australian Dementia Network, which has recently been established. Uh, and one of the main aims is to facilitate uh, entry of participants into clinical trials and really boost the clinical trials work we're doing in Australia. So it's a, a great pleasure to be part of this initiative because I'm very enthusiastic about Australia joining with the rest of the world in this global clinical trials platform. So I'll pass now over to Craig. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Craig Ritchie. I'm a professor of the Psychiatry of Aging at the University of Edinburgh here in Scotland, UK. Uh, I'm a practicing psychiatrist and day week I still work in, that, in a brain health stroke memory clinic. Uh, I was the academic lead for the EPAD program, the European Prevention of Alzheimer's Dementia program. Uh, and uh, lots of experience in undertaking and designing clinical trials. And over the last, I guess, two or three years, we've been working really closely with GAP in terms of setting up a, a network in Europe of uh, trial sites for Alzheimer's studies. Thank you. Tim. So why are we here today then? In general, Alzheimer's disease trials take too long to complete. The average prodromal trial takes just under five years from start to finish. And if you compare this to a cardiovascular trial, which is on average one and a half years, or an oncology trial at 2.3 years, the screen failure rates, as we can see from this slide, are also very high, more than 80% for a prodromal study that recruits amyloid positive subjects. Compare this to an average of a screen failure rate of 23% in cardiovascular studies, or 28% on average for oncology trials. These high screen failure rates and long timelines drive the cost of 80 trials well into hundreds of millions of dollars, significantly more than trials in other therapeutic arenas. And also, there can be a lot of variability in our clinical trial populations. Therefore, there is a need, an urgent need, to develop a global harmonized network of high performing sites that are able to start up rapidly that have a higher recruitment potential and reduce the variability by having less sites and more patients by site and utilize blood-based or digital biomarkers early on in the screening process to reduce the screen failure rate. The global network will have both a tactical benefit, higher recruitment rates, shorter timelines, and also a strategic benefit which is engagement with key health authorities at an early stage of drug development. We already have such a network developed in the US and John will share thoughts on this network and then Chris and Craig will discuss how we are going to implement this in Australia and Europe. So John, if I could hand over to you please. Thank you Lynn. When we started the Global Alzheimer's Platform in North America we made a conscious choice at, th at three levels. The first was we were going to create a network of highly motivated clinical trial sites dedicated to our mission. Second, 
we were going to make sure we had a heterogeneity in that network so we could integrate and and communicate the best practices of both the academic sites and the private commercial sites, uh, which are very different in nature in some respects, but both fiercely loyal to the mission of finding a cure for Alzheimer's. And the third was we were going to take it upon ourselves to try to help streamline studies and communicate with sponsors about the ability to better implement a study by listening to and advancing to the needs of clinical trial sites on a systemic, thoughtful basis, because the heart and soul of the success of clinical trials is indeed uh, the networks, the sites themselves, individual leaders who are all pulling together for a common purpose. In the United States and Canada, we now have 80, over 80 clinical trial sites dedicated to the proposition of undertaking studies faster with higher quality and a keen interest in reducing the cost and time associated with them. Our first step in the United States was probably the most material in that we were able to get everybody applied uh, to a single institutional review board, which turned out to be the first of its kind in Alzheimer's disease. That plus a various number of other tactics that we've been done in partnership with our sites has led us to great strides in reducing the time of startup of sites and the corresponding clinical trials. We are now in a total of eight studies using the tactics and startup. Our overall uh, observation from that first phase, building a network and startup, is that sponsors need to listen to sites and recognize that their on the ground environment is different at every site and yet we need to get uniformity and reduce variability across that network. That comes with communication and anticipation of uh, serious roadblocks uh, at an early stage. The other area that we've advanced on is uh, taking on a suite of recruitment tactics offered with a joining a broad set of customized recruitment tactics by site, all intended to improve recruitment screening and randomization against the average of the field. When you can do these things in partnership with sites and sponsors, you can get great results. And on balance already, we have uh, consistently shown a improvement in performance uh, so that in our last studies, uh, we have seen a doubling of recruitment, a doubling of screen rate, and a uh, 25 to 30% improvement in randomizations in our latter trials using this combination of tactics, most importantly led by our own face-to-face -face visits to our sites to advance the sponsor's protocol at an individual face-to-face -face level. Now in the face of COVID, we've done that more remotely. Well, we've made some progress, but progress alone is not enough to really help the field because we want to reduce trials by a year or two with the application of even better processes, which my colleagues will talk about. I would only say that as we move for a global approach, we need to do that with a similar respect for clinical trial sites, an enormous cultural sensitivity, and a firm understanding that using blood and digital biomarkers to better assess and characterize patients, we can double or triple the effectiveness of our early learnings in North America. And with, in partnership to my colleagues today and others across the globe, we hope to provide, create a global clinical trial network that will uh, eventually pull much more than just 100 million out of studies, but uh, tens of millions in any kind of study and reduce time by six to, uh, months to a year, a huge uh, contribution to the field. And now to explicate on how we can do this in Australia, I'd hand it over to my colleague, Chris. Thanks, John. Uh, first, I'll just give a bit of background uh, as to clinical trials in Australia. Uh, Jeff Cummings, I think in the past, has referred to a lot of clinical trial sites as mum and pop operations. 
I prefer to use the term hobby operations. And unfortunately, in Australia, that's a good description of the majority of clinical trial sites in this country. So there's a lack of standardization, a lack of professionalism, and a lack of networking. That results in delays, terrible problems with individual site governance approvals, uh, no consistency uh, from the various hospitals, et cetera, where most of these trials are run in their approach to governance and their turnaround times. Consequently, huge delays getting trials initiated. And I think something like the Global Clinical Trials Platform will set the standards, uh, will show those that are dragging their feet and lead to faster implementation of better quality trials. Other problems we have in Australia are late diagnosis of patients so that by the time people get a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, they're often too advanced to be included in clinical trials. There tends to be a lack of interest in clinical trials mainly amongst clinicians who are a bit nihilistic and also to some degree amongst patients. And we need a formal and sustained educational program to increase this enthusiasm and referrals to trials. I've mentioned the slow governance. Most trial sites are in public hospitals. It's not um, seen as their core activity uh, and we need, we need to change that attitude. We have high screen failure rates like the rest of the world. There's an aversion to lumbar punctures in Australia, which is common to certain countries, but not all. And an educational program uh, and standard setting, et cetera, would be helpful in overcoming that. I've mentioned the hobby trialists where there's a very loose network here, but no professionalism. And that's something that really can be improved by participation in a global clinical trials platform. We do have a bit of a problem with experienced raters from time to time. Again, the training and uh, standards offered by a clinical, global clinical trials platform would largely address that issue. And finally, Australia does tend to be a country that comes late to trials. It's got a reputation for good quality once it's in, but I'd like to, well, I would hope that Australia would be one of the earlier countries uh, uh, initiated into clinical trials going forward through participation in this platform. So governance efficiency can be improved standards can be improved, professionalism can be improved, networking will be improved, earlier participation of the entire nation in clinical trials, uh, techniques to reduce failure rates are part of some of the very exciting work we're discussing within this global clinical trials platform. Uh, I have introduced a system in Australia through the Australian Dementia Network where we do offer uh, free amyloid PET scans to clinicians in their patients that may be suitable for clinical trials. This is a carrot to get them into clinical trials. Once the patient is shown a PET scan of their brain full of amyloid, they are very highly motivated to participate in a trial. And we then have these motivated amyloid positive persons to refer to clinical trial sites, reducing the screen failure rate. Uh, we are discussing the use of the plasma blood biomarkers as another way to improve not only earlier diagnosis of patients, but also identify patients and reduce screen failure rates in clinical trials. Uh, uh, the Australian Dementia Network uh, has been set up through six of the major cities in Australia. We have screening sites and these feed the patients into various clinical trial sites. Another fundamental benefit from this sort of networked approach is to help the financial viability of these smaller operations, which can be a problem if there's under recruitment. In fact, it's a very frequent problem and is one of the reasons that uh, clinical trial sites uh, tend to drop off the map. So in summary, I think the global clinical trials platform will benefit Australian participation in clinical trials in numerous ways. And I'm greatly looking forward to uh, trying to facilitate Australian involvement in this uh, great endeavour. I'd now like to hand over to Craig Ritchie for the European uh, position. Thank you. Thanks uh, very much, Chris. I think 
for many of us who've been involved in undertaking delivering clinical trials and, and in some ways designing them too we realize that a clinical trial is always going to be a trade-off between the, the scientific the the methodological uh, and the feasibility and i think what often drives what actually happens in the ground of the clinical trials how feasible that trial is and chris alluded to this earlier we we often want to do trials in earlier uh, populations where the disease is, is less progressed but they just become in, unfeasible because it's very hard to recruit into those and i think what we're trying to do with the, the global alzheimer's platform in australia north america and europe uh, as, a, as a starting point is try to take sort of make everything more feasible by having a better network and that will include better rate of training better access to um, to, to, to registers and people who are, who are pre-screened. And that, that was in effect, <clears throat> if you like, the problem statement that led to the EPAD program being developed, the European Prevention of Alzheimer's Dementia, which is funded by IMI through uh, the European Union. And it was looking to say, can we find a way of identifying a very large number of sites, a very large number of people who are very well characterized to improve the efficiency uh, of delivering clinical trials? And, uh, to a certain extent, we were successful in that. We developed a large cohort, a readiness cohort. And, and one of the key assets that we probably delivered was a, a very large site network across Europe uh, of almost 30 uh, clinical research centers that all delivered really well, at least into the cohort study, which should have then transitioned into a platform trial. Um, that asset is something that we really want to, to, to leverage in terms of how we uh, take uh, forward the GAP initiative in North America uh, into Europe. And there are, there are challenges, of course, in Europe, um, as there are everywhere in the world, and uh, not least Europe is not one place. You know, Europe is 30 uh, odd countries, different languages, different cultures, different socioeconomic backgrounds, etc. So going into Europe is really almost like a sort of a microcosm of, of, of globalization because of all those differences. Um, but there are similarities, of course, as well. And what we wanted to do, what we have done, I should say, is we've run a survey uh, sponsored and supported by GAP and DPAD. And we, we sent out a questionnaire to 56 sites that we'd identified through EPAD. And we got an incredible response. 52 uh, sites replied to say how interested they were in joining a, a, a GAP network and identifying what they saw as the key issues. And the key issue that came up in 82% of people who responded was recruitment. It was, a, it was the one thing that was really fine. They found was holding them back in terms of delivering trials governance and other aspects were also there but, but the number one was recruitment and one thing that i think really is, is is necessary if we're going to have a sustainable uh, clinical trial network and clinical plan delivery is to try and somehow bring together clinical research with clinical practice um, we do trials on people with prodromal alzheimer's dementia because those are the people who come to see us in memory clinics and one of the other initiatives as part of this Davos Alzheimer Collaborative is healthcare readiness. And I think if we can work out a way to set up clinical services for people even earlier in the course of Alzheimer's disease uh, and do all of those assessments there, what one finds is what we call screening in clinical trials is what we call early detection and clinical practice. And I think that's how we need to, to dovetail the clinical trials with the healthcare preparedness. Uh, and that's something I think that's Part of this initiative we're really excited about but having this dialogue with gap and you know coming coming together over these issues is absolutely fundamental it's absolutely critical because there's no way we can develop therapeutic interventions for people with early alzheimer's disease or prodromal alzheimer's dementia uh, without a, a real game-changing initiative like this to, to, to really make a difference so i'll stop there and i'll hand back to lynn thank you gentlemen I think it was great to hear the successes that GAP Network has had across the US and hopefully we can take the learnings from the GAP Network in the US and apply across the globe, Australia, Europe and then the other regions globally to get this network up and running so that we can expedite drug development in this disease. Just like to start with some questions now in the Q&A session and this one is aimed at Chris in Australia. Um, and I'd like to know, Chris, if you could explain to us why you are so enthusiastic about introducing this model into the Australian clinical trial sites. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, as I mentioned, many of the clinical trial sites in Australia are what I call run by 
hobby trialists and, and they need help. They need help dealing with the bureaucracy in this country uh, and something like the Global Clinical Trials Platform by introducing standards, processes, procedures uh, will help. That'll reduce the burden uh, required, required setting up a trial. Uh, the sites need help with recruitment. Um, inadequate recruitment leads to financial non-viability. Uh, I've introduced something through the Australian Dementia Network that has helped somewhat with recruitment, but I think a broader global approach uh, would be beneficial. Uh, I'm also particularly excited about the prospect of introducing new technologies and the global Out clinical trials platform supporting that that can help us find and uh, patients earlier and reduce the screen failure rates. So extremely enthusiastic and certainly look forward to working with the global clinical trials platform. Thank you, Chris. We're now going to continue this discussion in live Q&A. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. We've already had our first question coming in, which is, what is your number one goal for 2021? And can you speak to how the COVID studies have affected the Alzheimer's site capacity? And I'd like to start off with Craig so he can discuss this question regarding the European site networks. Yeah, thanks, Lynn. I think there's two parts to the question, but there's one answer. I think the main goal for 2021 is to is to reopen our research activity to do Alzheimer's trials post-COVID. I mean, obviously, the last 12 months or so, um, we've seen a massive prioritization of COVID vaccine studies and COVID clinical research. Uh, we've not been able to see people until very recently in our clinical research centers because of social distancing. And these are, of course, very vulnerable groups. So I think, you know, as we, as we go through the early part of 2021, we're all optimistic that we're turning the corner, at least with, with uh, some of those restrictions being lifted. But I think as a community, we need to put some pressure on R&D departments and, and, and other sort of you know, governance parts of the, of the system to, to start prioritizing uh, Alzheimer's uh, studies again and get them up and running as quickly as possible. We've not been idle. We've not been just waiting to get going again. We've done a lot of work in terms of you know, building registers and such like. So hopefully when we do start, we'll, we'll start with a great deal of energy and success. Thank you, Craig. Chris? Well, personally, I'd like a COVID vaccination so that I can start international travel again and start attending these meetings in person. Uh, but in the more serious answer is I'd really like to see us making progress uh, towards introducing the blood biomarkers to improve screening uh, and detection earlier of Alzheimer's disease. So basically to assist recruitment as the number one aim. Thank you. John, any further comments to add here? Uh, number one objective for 2021 is uh, in the first half of next year, uh, get the GAP uh, EPAD network in place, get a, our first transatlantic clinical trial underway, uh, demonstrating uh, what it takes to get a true transatlantic network put together and work with Chris uh, uh, who, by the way, I have to, as an aside, Lynn, acknowledge that Chris is live this morning. And I think it's what, 3 a.m., Chris, or uh, something crazy. Uh, yep. So many, many thanks. Uh, but the third thing is, uh, I echo what Chris and Craig have said, we must and we will start deploying biomarkers as part of our uh, better characterization of uh participants in studies, and as we work with uh, our European colleagues uh, and Chris in Australia, that will be a priority. And that does lead us on nicely, John, to discussion about the BioHermes project, which is a biomarker project. Um, is that going to be a part of the GAP European rollout? Yeah. Funny that transition was great, Lynn. Thank you. Uh, I uh, So... GAP has initiated a study uh, in uh, collaboration with almost everyone on this uh, Lausanne conference uh, to do exactly what Dr. Zerhouni and company were talking about, which is uh, to bring uh, together, I think we now have uh, nine blood markers uh, and uh, four digital markers, all being tested against 
centrally read beta amyloid uh, PET images, uh, those uh, data will also contain a complete sequencing of the gene. It is our first effort to bring something that looks like real world evidence to what are the different platforms, different technologies of blood and digital markers, and how not just how they're going to uh, prognosticate the presence of amyloid, but ease of use, ability to deploy. And uh, we uh, expect that study to start uh, this uh, late this month and early next. Uh, but we plan to bring a phase two to Europe, feed it all into Dr. Zerhouni over in the cohorts group, um, because we believe that markers can change every element of a, a trial design for the better. Thank you. Going back to some of the questions that we're receiving, and this one, Craig and Chris in particular, looking at the payer system, do you think it's going to affect the implementation of GAP in your geographies, Craig? Yeah, I was, I was looking at that and, and, and <laughs> trying to work out how it might and what was behind the question, to be honest, with, because, because to my mind, the simple answer is no. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, obviously, you know, GAP has been set up in North America, which is obviously not a publicly funded health system like the NHS in the UK. But um, certainly commercial clinical trials, um, you know, the funding model wouldn't really have any impact or any differential as far as I'm concerned with what we do in the NHS. I think one thing I would say is that I think is advantageous in some ways is that in certain you know, parts of the NHS, what we're developing in Scotland, for instance, is a sort of national register. And that's going to be funded by the, the national, well, hopefully funded by the National Health Service at a national level. But I don't think what GAP does, what I know that GAP does, would have any um, any barriers to implementation in, in, in a publicly funded system. But maybe I'm missing something by the question, but I can't think of anything, to be honest. And Chris in Australia? Similar answer for the commercial trials, no. For academic trials, we do have some support from the federal government through their uh, their grant to the Australian Dementia Network, which part of their part of the role of the Australian Dementia Network is to facilitate clinical trials. So we've got some uh, government support, uh, but uh, the commercial income uh, would more than take care of the gap requirements for commercial trials. Thank you. Going back to the live questions. We've heard a lot, great deal about the importance of recognising the heterogeneity of human populations with Alzheimer's. Is there any thought of extending your platform beyond the Caucasian populations into Asian, African and other countries and populations? And John, maybe you can start talking about the plans for GAP and the expansion? Yes, and I want to... Uh, you know, George is my partner and my chairman and my friend, but I too want to join in complimenting him once again uh, and the team on a great Luzon. And one of the insights that uh, came to me yesterday uh, to answer this question is uh, we will be effective. We are committed to going to low and middle income countries and uh, and bringing trials and research uh on the ground uh, to various communities in those uh, regions. It is critically important we have blood markers validated for doing research in Alzheimer's trials because it's not a lack of appetite on the part of GAP. It's not a lack of appetite on the, even on the part of sponsors uh, to do studies there, but there are more uh, pet imaging machines in Southern California than there are in uh, most of Canada combined, just by way of example. Uh, you can't get ligand in most low and uh, middle income countries and you can't get the imaging done. So we have to be sure that we can conduct studies with markers that will then translate and do well as part of overall inclusion in studies. We're committed to that. Our timeline's probably a couple years out because the technology has to catch up. Uh, but I think when uh, their call for research uh, and investment was made, it was really a clarion call uh, in addition to everything else in the way of infrastructure, get the markers from prognostic to um, uh, diagnostic to surrogate so that we can actually uh, characterize patients and, and enroll them in studies 
and know we have the same level of accuracy and lack of variability as the rest of the world. And does the Biohermes trial with all the nine biomarkers, will those biomarkers be able to be utilized in the lower middle income countries, do you think? Yes, some, definitely. Uh, but they also, right now, our positioning on that under FDA guidance would be the prognosticating biomarkers, which will be very helpful. But to have a really valid, validated biomarker that could be in lieu of uh, CSF uh, or uh, PET is something that's a few years off, but very needed in my judgment, so that we can broaden these uh, studies globally. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. Another question that's come in, again, in very interesting. Are platform trials in your vision of clinical trial innovation? And we really haven't had them much in Alzheimer's. Maybe the Diane study is the closest we've come. Craig, what are your thoughts here? And then I'd like to ask Chris. How long have we gone? Um, <laughs> I, 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 of course, I'm a... Uh, Absolute convert and believe the only way forward is to platform trials. It was obviously a huge disappointment with the NEPAD program that uh, we weren't able to prosecute the platform trial, which we had designed from everything from governance, legal agreements. You know, you were part of it with IQVA, you know the, the work that went into it. The one thing that we just didn't get across the line was a compound to actually start the process. But, you know, I think the the the, the argument for a platform trial in terms of cost efficiencies, Bayesian adaptive trials, learning as you're going through phase two, rolling things seamlessly into phase three. All of those arguments are still as valid now as they were five years ago when IMI invested 64 million euros in, in setting up EPAD. So I think the lessons learned from EPAD have to somehow be um, uh, packaged up and shared so that when we do go back into doing, uh, platform trials, uh, we maybe overcome some of the hurdles that we we we, we didn't foresee uh, at the beginning of EPAD to make sure we get over around those more effectively. But yeah, the future. I mean, we learned this from COVID vaccine studies. The the future has to be platform trials. It's a no brainer. Chris, do you agree with that? Yes, I think I'm not entirely sure what the definition of a platform trial is. Um, we certainly. <laughs> Uh, are attempting and, and have set up a national platform for screening to create trial-ready cohorts, and that, that is paying off. Um, it is helping uh, speed recruitment for trials, but, but I'd like we need to invest a bit more time and, um, and increase the size of it. Uh, and yes, trials, uh, trial sites struggle for viability. Uh, we know the, the problems, the three years to recruit for a dementia trial. If we have platforms in place, this should uh, greatly reduce the time and cost of running a dementia trial and lead us to effective therapies sooner. I mean, I think to, to Chris's point, maybe very quickly, definition in my mind for platform trials, one where you have a single protocol and you can therefore share placebo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I strongly support that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't know how much time we've got left. There's, there's a quick question, which isn't really quick. Where do you see the blood biomarkers being used, gentlemen, in the screening process or in a pre-screen? Maybe a pre-screen in a GP surgery um, or a pre-screen out there in the community rather than at a neurology or clinical trial site. What are your thoughts on that? I'll start with Chris and then Craig and John. Yeah, I think it'll be a staged introduction and eventually it will get into the GP, uh, to the primary care setting and so be a pre-pre-screen. But uh, initially we've, we've got to bring it into the screening sites and the specialist clinics uh, so that we have pre-screened uh, prior to PET scanning, established that it is a suitable replacement for PET scanning in terms of screening for trials which I'm fairly optimistic it will be. And then uh, as, as we have uh, access to it, uh, wider access and validation, uh, make it available for use in primary care uh, to make, get earlier diagnosis. And that's another issue that we'll address. Delayed diagnosis of patients often means they're not suitable for trials. So I'm particularly keen in using blood biomarkers for earlier, more accurate diagnosis even in primary care to, to boost clinical trial recruitment. 
Thank you. Would you agree with that, Craig? A hundred percent. And I think the what we eventually want to see how, how many months or years ahead will be, you know, GPs doing an amyloid level and blood likely do a cholesterol level at the moment. But I think as well as technology being there and, and the, you know, the the knowledge about the accuracy of the test, et cetera, I also think there's that famous line that, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast every day. And I think what we need to do is bring on board GPs and others to to really recognize that the Alzheimer's disease is a disease of midlife that expresses itself as dementia in late life. Until you make that sort of cultural, clinical change, people like primary care physicians are not going to be onboarded to doing a blood test for Alzheimer's disease and people at risk. So there's a bit of work to be done. Again, healthcare readiness group can, can be working on that at the same time as we develop the tests themselves for, for drug trials. Mm -hmm. John, any further comments? Uh, Lynn, I only would add that I think we grossly underestimate the opportunity to use blood markers with practicing physicians uh, uh, to recruit for clinical trials. Uh, there was a question about uh, incorporating carers in the discussion more. Uh, we saw uh, some of this in the COVID environment here in the States but we think it's going to be a lot easier to talk to underrepresented populations and their treating physicians if the first introduction to a trial is a reasonably quick and non-threatening digital uh, biomarker test or a blood draw, things that they're very accustomed to seeing, the doctors are accustomed to ordering and, and interpreting, and we are going to be actively working to make that the mechanism for bringing in practicing physicians to refer to trials, because we'll provide them with some data that will add to their practice, and uh, they'll see that our approach is one that will benefit their patients. Okay, we have two minutes left, gentlemen, so 30 seconds. What would be your call to action for 2021? Craig? It's, I, I, I'm going to sound like a broken record. It is to really ensure that everybody walking into a clinic gets consented into clinical research. Thank you. Chris? I, I love Craig's uh, number one. I think I'll go with it too. I really <laughs> do want to see research built into clinical practice much more than it currently is. Okay. And John? This work with the team here to create the transatlantic network and then the Australian and Japanese networks so that as they consent them, we can give participants a better experience of faster trial time and discover a cure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody, for participating, for the questions that have come in and for listening to us.